Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian-American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. HIV-AIDS is a global pandemic that has affected the lives of over 35 million people. As of yet uncurable, it has caused devastation worldwide, with over 1 million deaths per year. We'll talk with Dr. Robert Gallo, recently in New York to receive an award, about the virus and its research at the forefront of its origin and treatment. On our latest segment of The New Italian Americans, we take a look at the work of photographer Alexo Van Dael, who joins us in our studio. <laughs> Dr. Robert Gallo, head of the Institute of Human Virology at the University of Maryland Biotechnology Institute in Baltimore, and leading researcher on HIV AIDS, co-discoverer of the human immunodeficiency virus, is here in our studio. Dr. Gallo, thank you for joining us and congratulations on the Leonardo da Vinci Award. Thank you, thank you for having me. How does a little Italian kid from Waterbury, Connecticut end up being Dr. Robert Gallo? What I went to go? medical school. Yeah, but what, <laughs> made, what made you go into biology? One is, I have to say, is my sister's illness. She had okay. leukemia, and uh, that illness, when I was at a f impressionable age, brought me into contact with research doctors in Boston at the Children's Hospital. So that clearly leaves a strong impression. Yeah. My father's close friend who made the early diagnosis on my sister's illness was a pathologist. He became a close friend of my father and from my father to me. And then lastly, my father was uh, in time scholarly. He became an expert in alloys. I saw these peculiar things called journals, scientific mm. journals, but yeah. on things you couldn't possibly be interested in, on metals, really. <laughs> and my father was a, a lot of times studying those journals, and I suppose that too left an impression. Let me read something from one of your websites, um, and it says, I quote, prior to the AIDS epidemic, Gallo was the first to identify a human retrovirus and the only known human leukemia virus, HTLV, one of the few viruses shown to cause a human cancer. In 1976, he and his colleagues discovered interleukin-2. The work on the leukemia virus being the first, HIV is a retrovirus, right. HTLV is a retrovirus, okay. but you know, Cadillacs are cars, Lexus are cars. Yeah. So they are, in many respects, they have some very similar properties. But they are not, when you look at the genes, uh, the sequence of the genome, they are not derived one from another. They're okay. like, let's call them cousins rather than brothers. Okay. The properties are quite similar in many, in some important respects. So we discovered this, was, we were looking for a virus in human leukemia. We found the virus in human leukemia. It causes what's called adult T-cell leukemia, a very, very specific leukemia, mm -hmm. generally of younger people. It's called adult, but they're often quite young, and it doesn't have to be adult. It can cause pediatric leukemia as well, but of a very particular type of T-cells that are of a certain kind of T-cell called a helper, or what is also known, I'm sorry for this terminology, but that's mm. unfortunately what science, CD4 mm -hmm. T-cells. It turns out that's what HIV infects also. Okay. Same exact kind of cell. So we and discovered this virus looking for human retroviruses. We showed, along with Japanese workers, that it caused this leukemia. And the interleukin-2 was a discovery of this growth factor that enables us to grow in the lab human blood T cells. So if I take your blood, mm -hmm. you have some T cells. I isolate those lymphocytes in your blood. I can use this growth factor called interleukin-2, or IL-2, and your T cells will grow. It was essential. 1976 discovery would be essential in 1979, 1980 to discover HTLV-1. Mm -hmm. A little about one year later, HTLV-2, which is not an important virus for disease, okay. but it's related to HTLV-1. And then HIV is a few years after that. So yeah. it's a strange, very strange coincidence that we're handed this technology just at the time the AIDS epidemic comes along. It was perfectly, we were like just in the perfect position because we had this experience and we had this knowledge and we had this growth factor. We were in a, a really quite an interesting, uh, mm. special place. And we thought yes. of the idea that HIV might be caused by a related virus because of our experience with this leukemia with virus. This leukemia yeah, virus. Right, right. Yeah. It's interesting because they both attack the same T cells. The same cell, they're yeah. transmitted the same way, yeah. blood, sex, mother to child. Mm. That, that's another common point. And, and so, and they have, they, there's, other coincidences. But, you know, if, if you're working with viruses that target this particular cell 
and a clinician tells you this new epidemic is of this particular cell, they're going, those cells are dying off, you start thinking and looking for examples, and you find examples in nature of a retrovirus that can sometimes cause leukemia mm -hmm. and make cells grow too much, and sometimes cause immune impairment. They, there are certain genetic changes. So we were thinking it was certain genetic changes in the outer coat of the virus that enabled it, instead of causing leukemia, to cause AIDS. It turned out it is a retrovirus. It is distantly related to the leukemia viruses, but really another family of retroviruses. Speaking of the whole mystery of all of this, do we really know the, orig the origin yeah. of the AIDS virus? Yes, they estimate between 100 and 150 years ago. Mm. You can estimate that, but you can say, well, how can you know that? You can study the rate of change of the genome a virus today and, uh -huh. and know exactly how long it takes to do this, that, and the other. And you can calculate when it first came into man. Mm. We know, and it's been proven by my former postdoc, Beatrice Hahn, there are plenty of African primates, unfortunately for Africa, because not in Asia primates and not in the Americas. That, and by the way, the same is true with HTLV. We have primate viruses that came into us as the leukemia virus only long ago many mm -hmm. tens of thousands of years ago, very likely. So, but this happened only in the last 100 years, 150 years. So you can show that many animals in the forest, chimps in certain forests, rainforests, in a very specific part of Africa, are transmitted even today. This can occur. Uh, you know, primate, subhuman primate to man, hunters. Yeah. A hunter gets bitten. A hunter, go, the wife or the hunter skin the animal. The blood. The blood. Yeah. Cut. So you get bit or the blood. So it happens a lot of times, uh, but it doesn't take all the time. So we had a few cases probably where it takes. But one particular, one or two, I guess it's really two times, enough, some mutations occur that allow it to be more transmissible, not only monkey to man, but man to man. And so that's the beginning. But that doesn't mean an epidemic. To get an epidemic, you have to kindle the fire. So what happened? And we think now you move away from solid science into sociology and history. Idi Amin, war, colonial powers, the highways, the truck drivers, families moving into cities, prostitution increased when there was increased uh, famine. Then you have the kindling occurring. Now, how did it become global is, I think, pretty straightforward. But it's not, again, science. It's you look at the history. What, what happened after World War II? You had increased travel, the airplane, mm. money, tourism. It was unique in the history yeah. of the world to that magnitude. The second, we had an increased sexual promiscuity. Third, we had the insanity of global intravenous drug abuse, which could transmit these viruses, right. along with hepatitis C, et cetera, et cetera, right. and other things as well. Yeah. So I think that's, you know, really let the thing get out of hand and maybe more than one place in a reasonable short period of time. There are different strains of HIV. For HIV, you have much more myriad of things. But I don't, I don't, it doesn't really change the therapy. Okay. It hasn't proven to change therapy at all. We knew that very early on. Now, vaccine, does it make a difference for a vaccine? Yeah, probably a little bit. So that's being, you know, looked at. Yeah. That's not the big problem. The big problem is that it's a retrovirus. They become you. They become integrated in your genes. Mm -hmm. Their genetic information becomes part of ours, not genetically transmitted in our sperm or our ovary egg cells, but the, the children of the T cell. The T cell divides its daughters, their progeny, etc. Mm -hmm. And also some other kind of cells get infected called macrophage. So when you have the genes of the virus integrated, you have infection forever and very soon. So this makes vaccine very rough because within 24 hours, it's off and running. Mm -hmm. So, you, and you need, you need the immune response. If you have a good vaccine, you need it to, to last because you can't keep boosting every few weeks or a month or whatever because you don't have time. Look at polio. You have plenty of time for the immune recall. You get rid of the virus, you're not going to get polio. It's in your gut. You have plenty of time for the immune system to be recalled. Uh -huh. With HIV, after a day or two, it's too late. So the immune system doesn't have time to be recalled. It better be there and at the get-go when you get infected. Yeah. That's a challenge. There are two issues here. Then there's both vaccine, which is preventative, right. and then there's post-infection. There's no reason why, unless very, very unlucky, a person today connected to the right doctors means specialists. This is not a job for any routine right. uh, practitioner. I mean, yeah, when you get the map of what to do, but there's too much... That, that's the problem of the 
of the uh, mm. variation that you talked about. The, you know, the, it's not that drugs don't work against things, but you can get resistant when you're treated. Yeah. So you can get variants that resist the drug. But generally speaking, those that are the wild type that are in nature, they're responding to these drugs. But once on the drugs, you start screwing around with the drug, don't take it properly, are in the wrong hands, the wrong physician, and not getting it right at the right dose, et cetera, you may get a resistant strain. Okay. Then you're in trouble. But if you're following things right, the vast majority of HIV-infected people should be living a reasonably normal life. Not everyone would like to get rid of the therapy and say, I'm cured, I don't need the drugs anymore. That's the goal now. Mm. But no one believes in the scientific community that we can be certain that every last viral particle is gone, every last gene that's been integrated is gone. Okay. What, is, what is the goal now in terms of therapy is to get therapy that's so long lasting that the person doesn't have to take pills every day. And then you might be able to reduce it to maybe yearly, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. In which case you can really say, essentially, this is a cured disease. Yeah. Drug companies yeah. work together. It's a marvelous example. Uh -huh. They combine the drugs together. And uh, now you can, you know, things can be combined mm -hmm. in a pill. So it's a yeah. big advance on a practical level. This has nothing to do with the science. And the other risks, sort of collateral risks that there may have been before, like um, cancers. Some yeah, the cancers or maybe disease, heart. Right, still vascular. there, but not still as there. much. Not, not as much, especially the cancers. Only lymphomas, oddly, are still occurring at a rate that's too high. They've gone down. And, and by the way, we also today are increasingly talking about, uh, as my friend Tony Fauci talked about in the Washington Post the other day, is talking about using the drugs for prevention. You know, when, if you have two people, uh, one is infected and one is not, you know the risk is high even when they're trying to be careful. Yeah. Uh, then the other the drugs, which can be generally safely given, if you're followed by the right doctor, you're using it on a person uninfected to prevent infection. It's called PrEP okay. program. And that's getting increasing attention Yeah. and will continue to get increasing attention. We have the AIDS war and we have the cancer war. How exasperating is it to deal with these two different types of wars? <laughs> If you stay with viruses, because cancers can be caused by viruses yeah. too, about 22% of all human cancer involves an infectious okay. agent. So let's just stay with viruses. I mean, we formed the Global Virus Network, GVN, and it's formed because of the virus threats. It's formed because of the possibility of viral bioterrorism. It's formed because we need to make sure we have enough educators in virology, enough young virologists coming in. We don't at the moment, and that's been a concern. And it's formed because we need experts in every single kind of virus. And there's a danger that we don't have that as a network to help WHO, to help CDC. And we don't want to have any time. This is glo truly global. Russia's involved, China's involved. And, you know, I started it five years ago. We did that because of the various viruses that cause MERS. You know, MERS from camel to man, new epidemic, takes off in Korea, Saudi Arabia. I was talking to people in the Global Virus Network Center in Israel, they said they have a lot of camels that are carrying these viruses and there's multiple strains again. Mm. Influenza every year, yeah. right? Influenza can kill us, sure. can kill children, can kill older people. Yeah. So it's always a serious problem. There are a lot of virus serious problems, a lot. And yeah. new ones coming. The hemorrhagic <laughs> fever viruses come to the Caribbean, they come to South Florida, they come to the southern part of the United States. Mosquito-borne viruses that are new that we didn't see before. So, we uh, so when you say how do we feel, I can't even begin to think of all the medical problems, and, yeah. and I don't spend my time worrying about all the medical problems. It doesn't do you any good. Right. I, it'll right. just say, Jesus, we can't solve these things. Yeah. But I can focus on making sure we're better prepared against viruses that harm and or kill. Let me ask you about the ethics of it all. Uh, one example being the case of Martin Shkreli who raised uh, the price of a drug, a cancer drug, from something like $15 to $750. I don't know the case you're talking yeah. about. And no, so that's number one, but what yeah. you described doesn't sound very nice. Yeah. But then I know stories, there's a CEO of Gilead and, uh, named John Martin, and I was told by my clinical colleagues when there was nothing for Africa, gave the drugs for free. And I said, gee, wow. Um, so we actually gave him a lifetime achievement for public service because okay. I heard this is characteristic of him. Mm -hmm. so that's a great gamble because you've got a board, right? You got stuck. Yeah. You know, let's say yeah, you're, sure. you're putting your money into sure. stock for Gilead. Yeah. You say, what? The guy gave away the drugs? So there are good stories. And uh, I don't know what's a fair price. 
some of them feel they, you know, they have to get back the research money and et cetera, et cetera. So what is the fair price? I'm not expert on this, yeah. but I, I'm, I'm sure just knowing human nature that some people have overcharged. And you gave an example of a, <laughs> a, yeah. a difficult pill to yeah. swallow. So clearly it happens. Yeah. But on the other side, there are these other stories. And are most companies okay today with the price of the AIDS drugs? I think in the United States, it's a reasonably uh, reasonably okay. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in, in countries that can't afford it, I, I hope the companies are trying to do what they can do. And the American program, PEPFAR, is was you know I don't know how many billion dollars it was, fifty eight billion over five years, and I think it's increased. That's not going to be sustained mm -hmm. with the economy, changes in the world and all that. I don't think we can sustain it. We have to solve the damn thing, mm -hmm. you know. It, yeah, it's because it's American taxpayer money. So is the government doing enough? Well, uh, Bush's PEPFAR program, President's Emergency Response uh, for AIDS, uh, was a huge investment. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for me, a better question was, did we do enough at the beginning? No, we didn't. Huh. And at the beginning, there wasn't enough adequate funding. That's a fact. And why do you think that? Do you think you, you think do you think there was a prejudice against? Um, I don't. You know. I, yeah. I, once again, I'm because like I you. Know I, you I, made I, a, I know you made a statement, um, and and I was happy to read it. That, and these are my. This is my word. The sort of a collateral positive effect. Was, a lot of positive Was that we we oh, society right. was forced to come into ter come to terms with sexuality, sexuality, or women's rights, women's rights, exactly. Patient advocates, right? What the activists right. did was historic. Right. I mean, they yeah. got the government to do more. They got yeah. us all to do more. They got us to think practical. I was still, not, I think we're not ivory tower, but I, I, let's call it upstream and downstream. I was still, my interests are always upstream, trying to find out the origin of things, you know? Mm -hmm. And I get my curiosity satisfied, and I'm off to something else. But you couldn't with this. I mean, the, first of all, the activists were right in your face. Yeah. They say, okay, what have you done with her lately? And uh, well, how come you're not working on therapy? You know, so uh, it was a reminder all the time. Money is coming in from the United States taxpayer. They expect things to happen for their health all the way, not just here's the cause, here's a blood test, great, wonderful, but don't go away now. You know, there's other yeah. things to be done, I think. So the act of this is a truly historical thing. There are a lot of positive spin-offs. And I, it, to science, which I can't get into, but to cancer research, to molecular biology, to immunology, but uh, in the social level, of course, hugely for the di greater tolerance for differences in sexuality. And do I think there was bias at the beginning? Sure, there was. But, I mean, it was too vigorous where we, where I know surgery departments that didn't want any person with AIDS in the, right. in the hospital. Yeah. Uh, and uh, nobody wanted to handle blood. I mean, you know, when we were doing research, I was told by a friend, uh, are you crazy? All you can do is, you know, harm somebody yourself or somebody in your lab. What are you doing this for? You could sit back on laurels, more or less. And why do you want to take in these hazards? I mean, you know, things that you would not expect. A headline from the Huffington Post in October 2015 says, this doctor invented the HIV blood test. Now he has a vaccine that may beat the virus. First is true, we did yeah. make the blood test. Yeah. And the blood test, in my mind, is the key advance in the history of the field. Without it, we don't have any drugs to test, we don't know who's infected, we can't follow the epidemic, and we can't preserve the blood supply. But you can't even know who's got AIDS, right? Yeah. You gotta wait till they get sick and half dead. So it was a powerful uh, advance. But uh, the vaccine, yes, we're in phase one trials with the candidate vaccine, however, this is what I know. Although we think we have a good idea, certainly novel, and although we have interesting results in monkeys, we know that no one's vaccine targeting the outer protein, if, the, if my hand is the virus, you want to target this. These are called the envelope proteins. They're coming at the cell. And that's what binds onto the cell surface. And that's, we want to start right at the get-go. You want to block these guys, mm -hmm. antibodies to these guys, for only reasons that uh, God knows, uh, they don't last. So we have to solve the problem of getting those antibodies to last. Remember I said you don't have time for an immune recall? Yeah. Okay, so that's critical. Now, every time we've tried, and as I look at the literature of the field, anybody else, when you go to try to make the antibodies last longer by goosing up the immune system, you make the T cell, which HIV infects, become what we call more activated. Mm. HIV loves activated T cells. It says, wow, there's a home for me. So the vaccine effect can be just totally destroyed because you now have a person, let's make it you instead of me, <laughs> who I vaccinated and he thinks yeah. he's protected. And, but to get the antibodies to last, we goose up the immune system. 
Now you're hyper susceptible yeah. to an, even with the vaccine, you're yeah. hyper susceptible. So we've got a double edged sword. Sword there, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. we got to solve that problem. And I can honestly tell you, I don't think anybody in the world has that problem solved. Thus, though we're in phase one, which is safety, before we go to phase three, we've got to solve this problem. From our primary studies, we went forward. Because okay. we can only learn so much in the monkey. We've got to see what's yeah, going on in man. Right. And we want to make sure it's safe, and it is going to be safe. But then we'll have to do phase two, which looks at the immunological response carefully. In this period of time, we better solve the problem of knowing how to get the antibodies to last yeah. before you begin what's called phase three. Phase three is efficacy trial, where you have large numbers, okay. and you're looking to prove it's effective, and that costs lots of money, and you, you got to really be in great shape to say, I want to do a phase three. That hasn't always been the case in this field or in many, in some, several other fields, but especially in HIV, people have gone to phase three when you know it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. At least many scientists sitting on the side say this is not, never going to work. Yeah. So I, I, we have to solve this problem. For, I just want to stay with our vaccine candidate, but as far as I know, for any candidate that's targeting these guys, and most rational vaccines are targeting these guys. We'll have to stop it there. And thank you very much for joining us on Italics. Thanks. Thanks very much. Very kind. Architect-turned-photographer Alexo van Dijl has been based in New York for over a decade. His works published in the likes of Vogue Italia and Vanity Fair, he has counted among his clients Bulgari and Loro Piana, just to name some of the Italians. And he has taken the portrait of legends such as Oleg Cassini. He has done reportage in Afghanistan, published a book of photos on his solo motorcycle trip, and has an ongoing project that has exhibited in New York, California, and Miami. Italiani.us. Alexa, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me here. You've had a multifaceted career till now, starting out as an architect and then moving on to photography, which in itself has been quite varied. Yes, uh, before I was an architect, I worked uh, three years in Berlin mm -hmm. and then uh, eight years in New York. And then I decided to follow my passion, which was photography. And seeing your, your portraits, you incorporate architecture and location as a big part of... I do usually even in fashion because, you know, I explore like way of composing the pictures with the surrounding, with the architecture. Mm -hmm. And in Italiani, it is a game word because Italiani is with NY at the end. So it was talking about the Italians, mm -hmm. first generation, born and raised in Italy, and then they moved here. Mm -hmm. But even talking about New York, in an indirect way. Tell us more about the project. What, what inspired it and, and how is it going? Have you learned anything from the beginning till now? Yes, the inspiration came like because I was already, I, I took already like picture of, uh, you know, interesting Italians mm -hmm. uh, here in New York, like Jennifer Missoni or mm -hmm. uh, Roberto Bolle. And so when I met like with the director of Casa Italiana, Zerilli Marimo, mm -hmm. uh, Stefano Albertini, I was explaining the project uh, and I showed him a couple of these pictures that I already took mm -hmm. and he liked the concept of the project so I started to work on it and uh, you know from the beginning it became like first an exhibition mm -hmm. and then like from the exhibition a Casa Zerilli Marimo it went uh, to Miami and then it went to Los Angeles. It's not finished yet mm -hmm. and uh, so I'm, I'm really proud of how it's you know getting along. Great. What fascinates you about your subjects? whether it's the Italiani or, or, or models or portraits that you do? But that was probably the reason that uh, I left architecture because architecture, I think, is um, something about beauty, mm -hmm. but it's very theoretical. It's about, uh, you know, lines, shapes, uh, so something like that. Instead, when you do photography, it's about beauty, it's about, you know, energy that you can create with a living human being. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's, that is the part that I really like. For this project, Italiani, you ask a series of questions to your subjects. Yes. I'm going to turn those questions on you now. Ali. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> I knew it was coming back at a certain point. We know what you do in your life for work, but what do you do for fun? My One of my lately love is for surf. So okay. whenever I can, I try to, to go surf, either Long Island or like when, I'm more, uh, when I have more time, I go to Hawaii. Oh, sweet. And then like, of course, museums, art, as much as I can, because I think that art, you know, painting and sculpture, and they help a lot like photography, mm -hmm. you know, not looking at other photographers, but looking at other, other artists. What made you leave Italy and choose NYC? <laughs> I know I see it was a challenge, but Italy, I left it already like after the university because um, 
I think I was looking for uh, some other experience, first of all. And I think that in NYC, I find it like, you know, a way where everything is much faster and much uh, fluid mm -hmm. uh, work-wise. There is a bit more, for sure, meritocracy. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I choose to, at the end, stay and, you know, fight here and work here and love here. Please share your best memory in New York City. I think the strongest uh, are two. One, it was uh, when I came back uh, from uh, Europe uh, after 9 11, because mm -hmm. uh, I was on vacation and I came back here the 16th of September. Mm -hmm. And I remember the city was really like, you know, a different city. And I lived here already one year. And so that moment, I really felt like something for New York. You know, it was almost like uh, seeing like something uh, wounded. Mm -hmm. And so I really felt like I had to be here. You know, I had some friends here and, you know, it was the right place to be. And that was really strong feeling, like, you know, coming from JFK to this very different New York. Mm -hmm. And another one very, very nice was uh, uh, when uh, in 2006, Italy won like the World Cup <laughs> soccer. That was crazy. What are your thoughts about this project, Italiani? US. When I started to do it, it was really nice because I, f I thought like after uh, 14 years, I knew all the Italians that were in, uh, in New York. Uh -huh. And, you know, this project proved me so wrong because I finally met like so really interesting and talented people that I really didn't know. Mm -hmm. So that, that part is really like what I like for, for myself. But then the other part, OK, sadly, like one of the subjects that I took picture of mm -hmm. uh, died last year. So when, when that fact happened, like I start to see the power of my project because I was thinking like probably like it's a dark thought, but one day all the people that they are in this project, they're going to be dead. Right. Mm -hmm. And this project are, is going to have like a real uh, historical, you know, meaning and power right. because someone is going to look at this picture of these people, at this, you know, talent and see what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes when you for me, when I look at picture like from like 1900, you mm -hmm. know, and I see this person, I, I say like, oh my God, I would really like to know what he was doing, you know, what was like his feeling for life and New York and stuff like that. So I think my project is going to bring that. How would you describe being an ambassador of Italian culture or st and or style abroad? I feel lucky that I was born and raised in such a rich country because mm. the culture is very rich. and. After that, you know, I had the fortune to travel around the world and, uh, you know, bring like my knowledge or like my creativity or, you know, whatever I learned there. Now we're done with your questions to you. <laughs> now I understand why they took so much to answer that, <laughs> that uh, interview. Yeah, because they're seemingly simple, but they're very complex. Yes, yeah. exactly. What projects do you have going on or what projects would you like to do in the future? Uh, now I have to prepare a sole exhibition in New York uh, in September, October. Do you know where that will be already? Yeah, it's going to be a real Lilac Gallery uh -huh. on uh, Fifth Avenue and 19th Street. And you have a book published of your solo motorcycle trip. That one, yes. That is the trip that I did from New York to San Francisco. Oh, that's right. You did, you've done more than one. Yes, you I did, did uh, one in 2013 uh -huh. and uh, one last year. And yeah. the second one is going to be online. Yeah, when I'm finishing uh, editing, because a lot of work yeah. digesting everything. Well, we look forward to seeing that and the exhibit <laughs> in, in the fall. Yes. And where can people go to find out more about your work? I have three sites, <laughs> not only one, three sites. <laughs> so one is my commercial fashion and portraits is uh, vandel.com. Mm -hmm. uh, my fine art work is alexovandel.com. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the special project Italiani is uh, Italiani and why. Mm -hmm. That US. Thanks so much for coming in today. Thank you. It was very nice. Thank you for watching. Tune in to our one hour Women's History Month special premiering March 30th. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.